We want to thank you for joining us at Cowboy Junction Church today. As you hear this message, we pray that your faith will grow and you will be both encouraged and challenged. We would really love it too if you would subscribe, rate, review, and share this online. You can also help us reach others by partnering with us financially. You can easily give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift at cowboyjunctionchurch.com slash give. We hope you enjoy the message today. Okay, take your Bibles and I want you to go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And right after Matthew chapter 6, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 18. We're talking about it being a stronger me. This is a faith series. We're talking about growing the arms and the feet when it comes to our faith. Don't just keep it on the inside, but becoming proactive and allowing faith to grow inside of us, that, out of us, grow out of us. It's a stronger me, okay? Now, we've been talking about all these little things. Last week, we covered finances. Let me just give you a little praise report real quick. It's so cool. Um, we had 88 people sign up for the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. Is that not awesome? Wow, I think that is just amazing. I remember when there was just 88 people who went to Cowboy Junction. Yeah, and, and to think 88 people. Now, what you got to think about this, that's somebody signing up or, or at least showing interest. And, and really, a lot of those are couples. So there could be like 160,000 people that just signed up. Who knows? And, uh, but but it's, I just think that's a miracle. That is just so cool. Now, now with that... Um, uh, we're going to continue this faith series for a stronger me and a stronger faith. And I want to talk to you today about something that I just really couldn't wait to get to. And, and let, me just, let me just stop and pause. Let me just get everybody's attention. This is one of the most important messages I'll probably ever speak in regards to your faith in God. Okay? It, you can't move on if you don't get this. And I just have a few minutes. I mean, I, I don't have long at all. And you can't cover the depth and, and, and length and width of this subject in, in the short amount of time I have. And I, I just have been praying for you guys and believing for you guys that even in this short time of us being together, a seed would be planted in your heart tonight to hear something bigger than I can say, to act on something bigger that I can get you to do, to believe in something bigger than, than, than the step that I ask you to and show you today. And it's all a stronger me, and I promise you this, you can't have faith if you don't have forgiveness in your heart. You can't know the, the width and the depth of all that God has for you if you don't have forgiveness. And, and the thing is, for every one of us, you can't learn forgiveness on your own. You can't do forgiveness on your own. You can't, you, you say, well, yes, I can. I'll just forgive everybody. Well, well try that. It lasts for about that long. And, and it, it comes, it jumps back up and it eats you up from the inside out, this unforgiveness. And, and in the world we live in today, have y'all noticed the chronic epidemic of unforgiveness? And not just, in, not just a person, not just an individual, but in everybody, in just everybody. There is just a dislike everybody has for everybody. Mike, you're nodding back there. We see it everywhere, don't we? It's a sad, sad thing. And let me just, let me just tell you, people like Mike and I, we got, we're old tender-hearted guys, and, and life's too short. Life's too doggone short to carry unforgiveness, especially if you add to that the depth and the width and the height and the, and the, and the massiveness of God, who in spite of, of who we were, and who we are, he still came and died on the cross for us. And, and, and looked past our failures and provided grace and mercy and love. And if, we, if that's what our Father did for us, do you not think that he can show us how to do it for others? Anyway, that, I, I want to read Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 says this. For if you forgive others their trespass, trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Uh, most people, uh, when they read this, they're kind of stunned a little bit. And there's been many people who have translated this as, you can lose your salvation. And, and that's not how I see it. 
This, let me just tell you, when, when whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm just going to let, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So what does this mean? I think it's really a, a question. It's an eye-opener. It causes you to stop and pause. And if you have been forgiven, why is it so hard for you to grasp forgiveness for others? If your debt was so large and you didn't even know you owed it, I mean, how many people in the world today are walking through life just saying, me and God are good, me and God, we're tight, and they have never sat down and realized that it it has nothing to do. Let's just take their sin that they've done in their lifetime out of it and just go with the sin of humanity who from Adam and Eve has traced all the way to you. And we all, because we're humans, deserve to die. And God wouldn't allow it. And then attack on all the things you did wrong. All the things you did that was anti-God, anti-Christ. And, and it says if, if, if God forgave you, how come it's so hard for you to forgive others? And then Matthew chapter 18 verse 21 says this. And Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and, forgive, and, and, and I forgive him? As many as seven times, and Peter really thought he was onto something there. I mean, I'm going to give the guy seven chances. And Jesus surprised him and said, I do not say to you seven times, but seven times 70. Uh, this is a big deal. I, I think it's big for us to pause and think that, that really, honestly, you can't understand faith if you don't understand forgiveness. Relationships are all around us. You need them, I need them, and I know you think you don't need them, but the fact is we're all built because we need, we need people. And God puts people in our life. But one of the things that I recognized the other day, and this is just kind of a fascinating um, little study, is, is the, the power of multiplication. In fact, let me just tell you, I, I, when I flew solo for all those years, just, just by myself, by myself going down the road to the rodeos telling kids about Jesus, by myself going down the, the rodeo telling the college kids about Jesus, college Bible studies, flying solo, um, speaking here and there, and, and, and at the same time single. I, flying solo is, it, it, as a single young man, y'all remember those days? Man, they were great, but let me just say at my best, at my best, I, I was a, an, an adder, an, an addition person. I was somebody that would blow in, blow up, blow out, and, and there were some fantastic testimonies. But flying solo, and there's nothing wrong with it. I've, I've been there a million times, and it, it's a wonderful thing. God grew me in my solo moments. But at my solo singleness, it was an addition process. One plus one is one. Two plus one is three. Three plus one is four. And only when I linked up with people, when I got to the rodeos or got to the church or got to the situation that I was going to to be at, to be in the ministry, it was when multiplication took place. And what I noticed is one person cannot multiply. I got this when I noticed that, that when Adam was all by himself, he wasn't a threat to Satan. But when Eve was created and then you had two that were now going to multiply across the earth, that's when the attack took place to Eve and then to Adam. There's something dynamic about relationship. There's a multiplication that takes place when two people are connected in agreement. But relationships are always going to be that thing that's tested. The best I've ever been is flying with Heather. There was something awesome when he put us two together. I was great solo, but man, multiplication took off. It's some of the coolest things you've ever seen. I, I, I don't want to take it for granted ever. When I do something, it turns out good. When Heather and I do something together, it turns out great. When, when we do something together, it's like one plus one equals 10. And then, and then 10 plus us equals 100. And then 100 plus us equals 1,000. And it's the darndest thing you ever saw in your life. And I love it. It's so amazing to see how relationship works. Do you know that when God wants to bless your life, he'll always bring a person and put that person in it? Now, think of all the blessings you pray for. Think of all the things you pray. I pray for money. I pray for, I pray for this. I pray for that. I pray this would be great. Pray. But, but I want you to stop for a minute. How many times did you pray for something, but it was a person that came in your life that brought the miracle around. 
How many of us have been in a situation, we wanted our house to sell so bad. I mean, God, all you got to do is just, you, just sell this house, God. You can just sell this house right now. And the house wouldn't sell. But you begin to pray, God, I beat this house to sell. And the next thing you know, a realtor showed up. And what did a realtor do? <laughs> Brought people to come look at your house. And, and, and you didn't see the miracle. It wasn't the house selling. It was God, God put a person in your life. That's why I tell all the single people, all the single people listen to me. You've got to wait on God's best. Don't you marry some Ishmael. Don't you marry some second best. Don't you wait for God's best. Why? Because, man, ain't nothing like multiplication with God's best. It's good stuff. That's, that'll preach right there. Better be careful. Bring it back, Ty. But begin to notice. Begin to notice when you start praying, God, I want to see you more. And it's just not you and God. He brings a person into your life and you sharpen each other. The longevity of every relationship, though, is this. It's the ability to forgive. The longevity of any relationship you're in is the ability to forgive. If forgiveness is not a part of your relationships, that relationship will not last long at all. It happens anywhere, everywhere. Every relationship has a different reward. Check it out. You don't get the fruit, same fruit in every relationship. But every relationship you're in brings a different type of fruit. Different people are different things, and together you bring a different type of fruit. And you're going to notice that there are fruit you're praying for, and it's different relationships that bring the different fruit into your life. But, but if every relationship brings a different re reward, every relationship has a different price. Every relationship costs something. Every relationship costs you somewhere, someplace, but the price of every great relationship is forgiveness. I don't care if you're at church. If you're going to be a church that God uses, you've got to have grace for each other. You can't look at the pastor and expect him to be God. You've got to realize he's human too. Can you expect things? Absolutely. But you've got to have grace. And that's one of the coolest things about pastoring and you guys. This church has always walked in truth and grace. And truth and grace. And I appreciate that so much from you guys. But at the same time, I, I can't turn to you at always and just real, and think to myself, how are we going to reach the lost if we don't have grace? So many times we want to reach the lost, but we have this standard so high that, no, 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 you don't fit here, and you don't fit here, and you didn't meet the qualifications. And so how important is it to have forgiveness for even the new relationships? To have truth. Hey, listen, we have to look like Jesus. We, we want to grow and look like Jesus. But, man, we all come in looking a little trashy and nasty and ugly. But, we, man, we got to clean it up. It's not about works, but it is about, I want to look like Jesus. And then the grace comes in and says, you're looking more like Jesus every day. Not a lot, but a little bit. And it's this truth and this grace until all of a sudden the two marinade together to this beautiful story of change. This is the story of relationship. But isn't it interesting that with every relationship, there is always going to be an opportunity for offense. Every time, guaranteed. I, I've been studying for echo groups, and this week's echo group, I just want to tell you, is going to be one of the coolest echo groups ever. There's just some cool, meaty little stuff in there, and I think when you get into a group and begin to talk about some of the things I wrote out for echo groups this week, it's just going to be a really cool little story, but there's this, there's this uh, German parable that I put in there this week, and it, it says, uh, uh, it, it, porcupines, it, it's a poem, and so I'm I'm not good at rapping, so I'm, I'm just going to tell you the Thai bean version, okay? And, and it, it says that porcupines have friends, and their friends are porcupines. And so porcupines like to hang around porcupines, but when it gets cold outside, porcupines huddle together so they can stay warm. But the colder it gets, the more the porcupines cuddle and huddle together, but the more they huddle together, the more they hurt each other. And so what's the story behind the story is that how do porcupines stay together? when they want to just separate and go their separate ways because other porcupines hurt them and other porcupines prick them and other porcupines poke them. And as cold as it is, it may just be better for me to be out in the open and freeze to death than to be poked by other porcupines. So how do porcupines stay close? And how do porcupines stay warm? They learn how to forgive each other. They learn how to turn to each other and say, I'm sorry, forgive me. And they say, oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. 
And it's this constant thing that keeps porcupines alive when it gets cold is this whole ability to forgive each other. And they make it through the night because they're able to say, I'm sorry. I, I, I got a tear in my eye. That's the most beautiful story. Ever. No, I'm joking. There's the, there's a, uh, but you're a little porcupine-ish. If you don't think so, uh, come ask me. Some of y'all and I, we got big quills. And you got a big attitude. And I do too. And you're sarcastic and I don't like it. But you know why we've lasted this long? Because we learned how to forgive. Because I love you too much. We walk in grace. We walk in love. There's two lambs sitting on my preaching bench right now. And aren't they just the cutest things ever? And these two lambs have a story. And I'm going to explain something today that I think is so rich and so important for us to learn how to not walk in unforgiveness but to walk in forgiveness. And if we can walk in forgiveness, we can walk in love, and we can walk in faith. And in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 7, you've got to turn here. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 7. And generally when the pastor says, turn to Leviticus, you know, it's nap time, okay? But, But there's this story. There's this, let me set this up. This is God turning to Moses and setting the precedence of what a ceremonial forgiveness session cleansing would look like. The children of Israel need forgiveness. They need to go before the Lord. And they need their sins to be covered so that God can be in their presence. And this is God's instructions to the children of Israel. In a process that requires two goats, two lambs, and, and they, God gives Moses specific details on what needs to happen for this reconciliation to take place. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 7, listen closely, he says this, He shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Okay? So where the door of the tabernacle of meeting, two goats will be led there. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats. One lot will fall for the Lord, and the other lot will fall for the scapegoat. Everybody say scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive. That's very important. Before the Lord. To make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. So let, let me show how this goes real quick. This is atonement day. This is the forgiveness of the nation's sins. And two goats are led before the tabernacle of meeting and a, and a die is cast. And the die tells who belongs to who. One lamb, you know, is the story of the lamb that was sacrificed for the covering of the sins of the nation. This lamb would be quartered up, placed on the altar, and it would burn, and the fragrance would reach heaven, and it was the symbolism of the blood. Now, you should be ringing uh, dings in your head, ding, 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 where the correlation is Jesus became our lamb. Easter is the day we celebrate the, the sacrifice of the lamb of God, not to cover our sins, but to wash our sins away. The blood of goats and animals covered our sins. But Jesus came as the Lamb of God and that washed our sins away. Beautiful, incredible story. But most people think it was just one lamb. But it was two. The other one is the scapegoat. Okay, And this goat would be prayed over and then taken out into the wilderness to get lost. Okay, let's go on. Verse 21. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions, concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a, and check this out, of a suitable man. Everybody say suitable. And that's something interesting we don't ever talk about. This, this suitable man would stand next to the goat as Aaron would take the goat and he would lay his hands on the head of the goat and 
everyone in the nation would begin to speak their sins onto the scapegoat. This is an embarrassing moment. This is a moment of of complete honesty. This is a moment of complete rawness. As dads begin to look at moms, really? And moms begin to look at dads, really, you did that? And teenagers, as as, as mom and dad look at teenagers, and, and they're confessing their sins. And as they're confessing their sins, they're laying their hands, and this goat becomes the very vessel that now holds the sin of the nation. The suitable man, after all of it had been done, loads up the goat. And his job was to head head to the wilderness as far back, far, far, far back as he could so that this goat could get lost. Now, I found a different translation. and It says the very same thing, but I want you to look at something. It said, a suitable man in the New King James. But this says the very same thing. It says, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat. Okay, remember that? And it says, putting them upon the head of the goat, he shall send them away. So the goat's going to go away. But look what it says about the man who's going to take these sin, these sins and this goat out into the wilderness. It says, by the hand of a, what does it say? A fit. Man, this couldn't be just any guy. This couldn't be just anyone. This had to be somebody who was fit enough to get this goat so far away from the camp that it wouldn't make its way back here. Because one of the most heartbreaking sounds was after your family had finally found freedom, after you had finally found deliverance, after you have finally been forgiven of all this junk that has weighed you and your family down and you have prayed your sin onto this goat and one day you're out in the field and you're working and you hear meh as the sucker came back and one of the most horrifying things was for now this goat to make his way through the wilderness through the jungle through the river through the valley all the way back home this took a suitable man This took a fit man that could live in the wilderness, that might have to go a long time without water, that couldn't get lost, because that's the thing. You wanted the goat to get lost, but you had to make sure you didn't get lost. And you had to make it back home. You couldn't be so in love with the wilderness that you didn't want to come back home to the relationships that were important to you. Here's the beautiful part about this story, and it's the story of the two lambs. The sacrificial lamb and the scapegoat lamb were two lambs that served two responsibilities, two separately. But the beautiful part is this is the story of Jesus. Jesus became both lambs. Jesus became the lamb whose blood was sacrificed and washed away our sins. And when Jesus was on the cross, he became the sin of the world. And the anguish that he suffered on the cross was all of the sin of the world from the beginning of time to the end of time coming upon him. And he was a fit man who could take this. And when Jesus died, He took it to hell and he conquered death, hell, and the grave so that we could have life and we would never hear again, meh, ever again, ever again, ever again, ever again. And why is that story so important? Because some of us are still struggling with, I got this, God, I got this, meh, God, 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 I got it, trust me, I got it this time, I got it this time, I I can carry this. And here's the funny thing about the story on the scapegoat. Every year, the goat came back. Every year, the goat came back. And the depression of we just can't get, we can't shake it. We can't get rid of it. And that's why this story is so important about Jesus because maybe you're carrying something that doesn't belong to you. Maybe you're not letting go of something or maybe you're trying to be the fit man. 
You know, I couldn't wait to use this point. Are you ready for this? I couldn't wait to use this. Jesus was crossfit, you guys. <laughs> Jesus, y'all, Jesus was crossfit. Shut the front door. Jesus was crossfit. And it's this story. It's this story about why are you holding on to unforgiveness? Meh. Why do you keep carrying this? Meh. You, you're trying to carry something that you think you got. Well, how's it working for you? Many of us associate forgiveness with uh, an act, a process, a work. But do you know that that's where it starts? It comes with the identity that there is bitterness and anger and there is unforgiveness in my heart. It, it, just like that, Holy Spirit can knock on the door of your heart. And you realize that half of your issues with the relationships you're in could be because of that one relationship that you were in. Whatever they did to you, whatever happened in that moment, whatever it was. And once we identify it, it's almost embarrassing that it is, it is jacked with us this much. And our tendency then is faith got us to this point, but faith now is removed as we go, okay, God, thank you for showing me. I'll take care of it. But you're not fit enough to learn how to forgive enough. You're not. So how do we practice forgiveness? God's going to have to show you. God's going to have to show you how to love again. God's going to have to show you what love looks like. You can't figure out love on your own. Let me go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. It says this. It says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's how important forgiveness is. The length of relationship is desired by the ability to have mercy. But forgiveness is the seed for longevity. When I show mercy, God shows me mercy. And when all of a sudden I begin to realize that if I show up with an ounce of forgiveness for, towards somebody, God shows up with an ounce of forgiveness for me. But when I show up with a gallon of forgiveness, and I start thinking about this, you know what? Let's not think about them. How much have I been forgiven? Father, show me even more the forgiveness that was available, that is available for me. And I show up with an, a gallon of forgiveness. God shows up with a gallon of forgiveness for me. And when I show up with a truckload of forgiveness, God shows up with a truckload of forgiveness and grace and mercy for me. Grace is truly amazing. It's one of these things you have to stop and pause and realize that he can and he will rescue you right where you're at. He will love you right where you're at. He will, he will, he will pick you up. He will wash you away, wash it away. He will redeem you, sanctify you, born again, all over again. But then at the same time in that whole process, he will show you how to love other people. It's the, it's the darndest thing ever. You will see the most selfish people in the world turn into the most loving, generous, kind people ever. I had a situation happen this morning where, where just this unlovable person is, is in, in our life. And, and she's, she's not in our family, not in our home, not in our church. She's just in another, another deal. And she's just unlovable. She's just, she's just tacky. Anybody know tacky people? Just tacky people. And one of my buddies texted me and said, man, it's just hard to love her. It's hard to love her. And I said, that's, the, that's, that's not our job. Our job is not to learn how to love people. I think it starts with us praying for her. Jesus, change her. Jesus, just get a hold of her right now, God. <laughs> what kind of love is that? <laughs> Father, I was once unlovable too. 
Father, if you didn't love her, she'd be dead. You guys think about that. How do you know that there's still hope for somebody? They're breathing. So there's still hope. So Father, start with me. And I just want to confess, I need grace more than anybody. So I ask for it. Now show me how to give it. And all of a sudden, Holy Spirit just began to coach on me. Somebody hurt her bad a long time ago. Him say, I'm not going to tell you what happened to her. But somebody hurt her bad a long time ago. And all of a sudden, in just a matter of seconds, I went from thinking she's unlovable to thinking I love her because there was one time somebody didn't love her. I mean, seconds. That's the power of mercy and grace. I've got one more thing I want to show you guys. You got time for one more thing? In Numbers chapter 35, you can turn there. Numbers chapter 35. I got some Old Testament teaching today, you guys. It's some, I love this stuff. Numbers, Numbers. I tell you what, Numbers, if you read Numbers, like, like, let me just tell you, as you're turning there, let me just tell you. If you're like, oh, I need to read Numbers, this is so good. It's a hit and miss or Numbers, okay? <laughs> it's a hit or miss. You may have to, you got to eat the grass and spit out the rocks in Numbers, Okay? And every now and then there's something that pops up. Now, now, what is it about Numbers chapter 35? This is also Moses. But it's also this side of Moses where God is now how, explaining to him how to set up the community. This is a, a community a construction right before our eyes. This is God saying, I want cities here, and I want communities here, and this is designated to these folks, and this is designated to these folks. And God says one of the most fascinating, most overlooked things you, you've ever seen. In fact, when I was younger, I, 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 I've missed it. I can't tell you how many times, but now I'm older. I'm, I'm fascinated with the details. And in verse 6, it says, Now among the cities which you will give to the Levites, and the Levites were the priests, they had a set of land set aside just for them. And they also retired at 50. Isn't that cool? I think... Maybe we should think about that more. That would be cool. Okay, anyway. But now among the cities which you will give to the Levites, you shall appoint six cities as the cities of refuge. Cities of refuge. To which a manslayer may flee. Really? But then it goes on. And to these you shall add, which means you'll start with six, but you're going to add 42 cities. So all the cities you will give to the Levites shall be 48. These you shall give with their common land. Cities of refuge. It starts off with six, but he gives Moses plans on building that number up to 48 cities of refuge. They're specifically for the manslayer. It's for people accused of a crime, people who did a crime, people who did something that hurt someone. It goes on in verse 11, it says, then you shall appoint cities to be cities of refuge for you. That the manslayer who kills any person accidentally may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you, for the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. And the cities which you give, you shall have six cities of refuge. You shall appoint three cities on the side of the Jordan, and three cities you shall appoint in the land of Canaan. And this is God saying we, we need, that they need forgiveness here, and you've got to uh, apply grace and mercy here, and there has to be a moment that these guys need an opportunity to get things right over here, and which, you shall, uh, which will be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be of refuge for the children of Israel. It's not just the children of Israel, but also for the stranger and the sojourner uh, among them, that anyone who kills a person accidentally may flee there. Cities of refuge were these cities that if you went to those cities to bring vengeance on someone, it's going to be worse on you than the person who did the crime. And it was God's way of saying, you're, you're, you're never going to make things right if you do it your way. You need to let me be God. It was God's way of saying, you can't do what I can do. And there's a bigger picture here than even you care about. 
and your feelings are raw right now and your experience is raw and you were robbed and something was taken from you, but I'm God and I have to be able to do what I do. And if this person is in the city of refuge, you stay where you're at and I will be your God and I will take care of you and I will bless you and I will heal you And you will learn how to walk in my truth and my path and the plans I have for you. And you'll learn how to forgive. But it also gives me an opportunity to do something in their life. Even when they're at the most dumb, stupid moment, I'm still their God. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because that's got to be one of the coolest things if you see it from an outside standpoint. But if you were the one that it happened to, you would want to wreak vengeance too. And this was God's way of saying, stop. Emotions will cause you to do things that get you out of my plan. Your emotions will cause you to be outside of my will. And you have to stay where you're at and let me take them where I can heal them. And they could be wrong. They could be 100% wrong. We may find that that they did exactly what we thought they did and they're going to have to pay for what they did, but I am still their God. And you're going to have to have the faith and you're going to have to have the grace and you're going to have to have the love and you're going to have to have the mercy to be where you're at and let me be your God and let me take them over there and let me be their God too. And that's one of the hardest things to hear but it's actually one of the most beautiful stories if you think about it. The grace and the love and the mercy, even for the guilty. So I don't know where you're at. I don't know how this applies to you. In the world in we're, we're, we're living in today, I, I just wanted to stop and pause and, and, and just kind of talk to you guys about some of the issues that are going on in our world today. Have there, has there been people that right now as we speak, ugly, horrible things have happened to them in their lifetime? And the people who did it are still alive and walking around. And the issue, though, is this, is that there's kind of this feeling is that we can get back from them what they stole from us. And I just want to stop and tell you real quick, you can't. If you've ever been stolen from, uh, there's very rarely that you get back everything that was taken from you. Or or you may get it back, but it didn't come back in the condition that it was taken from you. And in, in our spirits, we have this mentality that when we get it back, when they justify what, when, when they, when they rectify what they did, when they make it right, I'll be a better person. And, and let me tell you, I have rarely, rarely seen people get back what they lost. But I've seen so many times people say, you know what? God will restore seven times what was stolen from me. God will restore even better what was taken from me. Even Jesus went as far to say this. If they take your cloak, give them your jacket too. What? Because you can sit there and lose the rest of your life because you lost a stupid coat. And, and I want to be careful. There's some people who's lost a whole lot more than the coats in this room. And it's not dumb. And it's not stupid. But at some point, you've got to realize, if you're not careful, the 15 minutes of what they stole out of your life will end up be the next 50 years of your life if you're not careful. And you have to go and say, I can't get back what they took, but I can go before my God. My God will restore in me better than anything that person could have gave me. My God can do something in my heart bigger than anything that person took out of my heart. My God can be bigger. My God is better. My God is bolder. My God loves me so much that even right now, in my pain, in my hurt, 
I'm going to step away from unforgiveness and I'm going to forgive that person and I speak blessings on that person and I pray that you use that person and God, in that city of refuge where that person is, you just bless them and talk to them and I pray one day, one day I'll see the bigger picture but right now, God, I can't think about them. It has to be something that you do in me. Forgive me as I forgive those who've trespassed against me. Come on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Every relationship has a weakness. Every relationship. But two people are stronger than one. And three people are even stronger than two. And iron sharpens iron. And what we find is, is that relationships are one of the greatest things God's given us. But the greatest thing that holds relationships together and gives it longevity is the ability to forgive. We're going to do something. I'm going to pray for you. And, and, and I want you to pray for me too. And, and, and we're going to do something. There's two, there's two types of people I'm going to talk to real quick. And, and, and I, just, I just want to just, just think about something real quick, okay? The first one is I, I just want to be upfront and honest and tell you, if you're in this room and, man, you like church and, and I like Christians. I like hanging around CG. I like hanging around Ty. I like hanging around Heather. We, we're pretty cool people. But that doesn't make you a, a Christ follower. That doesn't make you born again. It has nothing to do with salvation. We're, we're kind of the cherry on top. The, the gift is the day that you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's the day you realize it. I need Jesus. And so I want to just be really upfront and honest with you that if you don't know Jesus, you don't have forgiveness. And one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life was the day I realized how much I needed a Savior. There was a God-sized hole in my heart. And I remember being a young boy and getting it. I said, Jesus, I need you. And so I want to just tell you before... The, the last thing we're going to do tonight is I'm going to turn back to you and I'm going to say you've had enough time to think about this to chew on it but have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you ever said Jesus I need you? It's not about going to church it's not about being a good person our best is filthy rags to his righteousness and he makes us a new creation but it comes by confessing our sins to the Lord and confessing that we need a Savior. And I'm going to come back to you, but I want you to think about it. And at the end, maybe you'll pop your hand up and go, Ty, will you pray for me? Man, I would love to. But there's another group. Are you in this room and you would go, Ty, there's some unforgiveness in my heart. There's some bitterness. On the outside, I hold it together really good, but down deep, I, is that acidy, nasty old feeling I've lost my joy. I've grown old overnight. You may be 20 years old in this room and you feel 90. And there's no need for that. God wants to heal your heart. God wants to heal your heart starting tonight. And you're, you're going to have to work with me for a minute because I've been praying for you and this is, this is something I really believe that God wants us to do. You ready? There's our scapegoat. Okay? And I, I want to first ask this question. Who am I talking to? Is, is there something that you, we just need to forgive? We just need to let it go. And so what I want you to do is bow your head right now. And I just want you to start talking to the Lord. Father, I need you. There's some things on my heart that have just been kind of ugly. There's some things that I just have talked to you about and talked to you about. But tonight I just really feel that some breakthrough is going to take place. Father, I just, I just call out that person to you right now. And, and right now, I'm ready to just hand them over. And I'm ready to forgive. And so with your head bowed, I want you to do something. When you're ready, I, I want you to just open your eyes, look up here. And, and if you're one of those people that says, I got some unforgiveness, and I'm ready to forgive. Would you just open your eyes and look up here real quick? One, two, three. 
yeah, all over the place, yeah, yeah. Would you stretch your hands out just like Aaron did towards this scapegoat? Just stretch it out right now towards this goat, okay? And I'm going to do something. Watch this, watch this. I'm taking a lamp, I'm taking the stuffed doll away, and now I want you to reach up to Jesus. I want you to reach up to Jesus. There you go. There's our lamb. There's our lamb that takes away our sin. And Father, I just pray that you forgive me. Forgive me of my sins and forgive them of what they put me through. And Jesus, I pray that you would bless them. And Father, restore my heart. Show me how to love again. Show me how to live again. And I bless them again. And Father, I pray while they're in their city of refuge, you would do what only you can do to them but I gotta let them go I gotta let them go I let them go I let them go they have no more control over my life there's no more control they have over my heart over my mind I let them go you are my scapegoat you are my fit man you are my cross fit Jesus and now I want you to run run Jesus as far away as you can Get that bitterness lost in the wilderness. Hallelujah. I want you to do something. The moment you're done, the moment that you go, you, you just feel like you've let it go. This is between you and him now. And when you're done, you put your hand down. And this is between you and him. my folks is there anybody in this room I've been praying that you would say Pastor Ty I need Jesus and tonight I can think of no other thing that I need more in my life than for my Savior to become my Savior Ty I need Jesus would you show me who you are? Would you raise your hand and look up at me? I, I want to accept Christ as my Savior tonight. I see you there. Anybody else? Raise your hand look up at me. Anybody else? Yeah. There are two people. Is there anybody else? Okay. Everybody look up here. Two people want to accept Christ as their Savior tonight. Isn't that cool? Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. All right. So here's how we rally around this around the church, okay? We're going to pray. And, and for everybody that said, I need Jesus, use the words that I give you as your words. Because sometimes as young Christians, we don't know how to pray. What would I say? I don't know what to say. Okay. We're going to do it as a church. And you make these your words, okay? Okay, so bow your head. Jesus is right there just say this church help out Jesus I need you I'm so sorry that every time you spoke I ignored you I chose everything except you please forgive me forgive me of my sin and I want you in my life I ask that your blood would wash away my sins Jesus I believe in you I am a new creation in Christ Jesus the old me is gone and I am now a new baby in you I love you I believe. Amen. Come on. Come on. Isn't that cool? Here's what's going to happen this week. You're going to look at relationships completely different. You're going to look at your marriage completely different. 
You're going to look at your friendships completely different. If today you accepted Christ as your Savior, you raised your hand, Pastor Jeff and I are going to come over here and we got some stuff we want to give you, okay? For everybody else, man, let me just tell you, this is just the beginning. That old nasty devil, that old sorry snake, he's going to come back and you just you just stop right where you're at and you go back to that scapegoat and you cast your cares upon him and you forgive all over again and you get that goat lost. Man, come on. Our God's good. I enjoyed tonight. You guys were a fun group to talk to. Stand to our feet. Cowboy Junction. It's time for us to love God, love people, and have no limits in our life. The prayer team is over here and over here, and they'd love to pray with you. If there's anything that they just need to agree with you on, please step out. Go ask them for prayer. Leave the chairs where they are. I love you. Jesus loves you. Don't you ever forget it. I'm going to come over here so everybody that accepted Christ can give you some stuff. You guys have a great week in the Lord. See you later. Thank you.